Cool. Well, firstly, can everyone hear me? Yes. Nice. Uh, thank you very much for coming. It's nice to see a, uh, a big packed room. Not so packed as Cyrus's talk, if you went to that, which is a bit sad, but... Um, cool. Well, as a kind of a brief introduction before I get into anything, um, I'm James. I'm the art lead at Riff Raff uh, currently, and... You know, um, I my background is basically in, in sculpture. It's in uh, fine art sculpture and moving into digital sculpture. So a lot of my thought processes around sculpture in general, but particularly digital processes, come from a traditional background, come from a traditional standpoint. So a lot of what I'm going to be talking about is uh, alluding to that um, a fair bit. My background, like I say, comes from fine art but also visual effects and 3D modeling, worked in 3D manufacture and 3D printing, collectibles, virtual production, game art, and now in management. So kind of across the board. Um, so the other part of what I'm gonna be talking about, uh, and as the title kind of suggests, is the fundamentals of sculpture. Some fundamental aspects that I see popping up every now and again, more often than not actually, with people starting out sculpting, digital sculpting, um, but also with, with kind of more seniors, people more seasoned in sculpting. So it's going to be a little bit PC. There's going to be some traditional stuff. There's going to be some tips. There's going to be some ideas. Uh, so bear with me. Hope you, hope you enjoy it. First thing, sculpting's really hard. So prepare yourselves. There's certainly going to be some tears. I know I've had my fair few tears, uh, tears it's um it's been a hard journey and it continues to be you know with the evolving landscape of digital art you have to keep up with processes you have to constantly be the best art station and various things like that are always pushing the level of people's work so actually uh, retaining a traditional um, uh, workflow in your work is uh, it's really good it's for a foundation you know you really want to keep that foundation so speaking of traditional and digital, I've got this slide, you know, traditional and diverse is digital. Uh, not that it's a contest, uh, neither one is better, but certainly they have different ways of working. You can't work digitally exactly the way that you work practically. You can certainly not work practically uh, the way you work digitally. When I also, uh, let me just um, kind of, make a, a definition when I when I say practically or practical sculpting uh, I might interchange that with practical or traditional or analog or whatever I'm basically alluding to working in clay or working in some kind of physical media digital sculpting is pretty straightforward I'm kind of talking about you know digital sculpting um, it may be you know there are some examples in here and I use ZBrush but the examples are based more around ZBrush but these concepts that we'll talk about, uh, they're not, they're, you know, um, they're program agnostic. You should be able to kind of swap them around. I know a lot of people use uh, Blender nowadays. A lot of people are sculpting on their tablets or, or whatever, but uh, just, just to make that distinction. So traditional and digital media, they call for different ways of working. Um, and despite their similarities, they, they're just fundamentally different. So you can, we'll, we'll talk about how you can use one and the other, but uh, they are different. Uh, each have their pros and cons. You know, working with practical sculpture, you're dealing with physical media, you're dealing with things like gravity, you're de dealing with tactility, you're dealing with heat, you have to heat up clay, it's hot, it melts on you, you know, you're dealing with that constantly. You also have to deal with armatures, which is really hard, um, and you're just contending generally with the forces of the real world. Digital sculpture, on the other hand, you don't have to deal with any of that stuff, uh, which can be a blessing and a curse. Um, which we'll also talk about. Speed is something intrinsic in digital sculpture, but this can be a real issue. When you're working at speed and you're missing the critical thinking of, of how you're working, that can, you can run into problems. 
So I encourage all sculptors, uh, or anyone for that matter, you know, people working in concept art or uh, painting or whatever, to pick up some clay and do some practical sculpting because it can be really humbling for one, but it can also be very informative in how you're actually working. You'll learn a lot about the process. So different workflows can inform each other as well. You, you, we'll talk about how working slowly in, in clay can actually inform the way that you're working digitally. By slow, slowing down, slowing down your process and thinking critically, you can actually become a much better sculptor. I forgot to say at the start actually as well, the title of this, um, title of this talk is how to get good at sculpting, but that just by itself is a little bit of a misnomer. I tricked you a little bit. You can't really get good at sculpting or you can't just get good at sculpting, you know. You can get better and you can incorporate workflows uh, that will help you become good at sculpting. What does good look like though? It's just such a broad term, you know. Really what I'm talking about is getting, becoming efficient and fast in your workflows without compromising your, your artistic integrity or the integrity of your sculptures. So I'll start here, start with sketching, generating ideas quickly. We'll get onto some images soon. But sketching is a way of generating ideas quickly. And this is something intrinsic that you should use in sculpture. Sculpture and sketching are intrinsically tied. By using your body and, and sketching out things, you'll capture dynamism in your work. You'll, you'll be able to, um, you know, be able to work through problems all these nice things that will directly translate into your sculpture. Working through difficult problems is a massive one. So when you run into something in a sculpture and it's hard to work quickly and change problems, working in a sketch, have a sketchbook by your, by your side and sketching uh, can really help you work through those problems. Um, you can also help yourself predict some problems that might occur later on by sketching out, you know, an idea first and breaking down what, what the problem might be. So we'll talk about that as well a little bit. Sketches don't need to be good, you know, they're, they're supposed to be informative, they're supposed to be helpful, uh, but they don't need to be good. I think this is a real problem that people fall into when they're, when they're sketching, particularly for, you know, a way of helping themselves to get better at sculpture or painting or whatever the case may be, that they fall into going into detail and in sketching. Uh, but it should purely be a way of helping yourself work through a problem or come up with an idea quickly uh, to help your sculpture. You know, this kind of is analogous to a sculptural maquette. When you're sculpting practically, you have to block out um, a sculpture. Uh, particularly if you're working at a large scale, you know, this is something that you don't deal with digitally, but when you're working at a large scale, blocking out a sculptural maquette so you can work through problems, uh, so you don't have to encounter them later down the line and then fix them in this incredibly arduous kind of repetitive uh, way, uh, sketches can help you in exactly the same way digitally. So this is kind of a, an example of what I mean by that you know this is a sculpture on the on the left here on your right uh, obviously that's not a sketch but um, you know a sculpture that was done in clay and it got to the point where I was like I have no idea how to pose this thing and at the point where you've got a bunch of clay there and you need to move something it can be okay when you're working phys physically to move things and, and shape things because you can you know, you have the incorporation of your body to help you. But it can be really slow, and it can be even slower digitally. Uh, so sketches like this can help you kind of see, map out your, what your game plan might be. Uh, and in this case, sketching helped a lot for that. The other thing is sketches can be vague. Uh, and I'm sorry I'm, I'm going on about these sketches, but they're such an important part of... of my workflow and something that can be incorporated into yours, I think they're a really powerful tool. Um, when I say sketches can be vague, uh, you know, I, I've got written here, have you, have you ever looked at an image or a sculpture that was kind of blurred at the edges? Um, 
and you you can kind of imagine um, a sprawling world, you know, before you. You know, there's there's insinuations of something, but actually your imagination is incorporated in in that image, and that's what really kind of takes flight. That's what really ignites your imagination. So that's one reason for keeping sketching vague. It can be a window into the imagination. The other reason for keeping it vague is it's a tool for visual thinking. You know, it's not a doesn't necessarily need to be, you know, a fine art piece, although they can be. It's a tool for visual thinking. Details are the enemy. I mean, it's pretty, um, it's a pretty simple sentence and we've kind of gone over that. So this is another kind of example of a series of sketches that help to inform rather than, you know, are they any good? I mean, no. But they really help to inform things like posing, uh, some kind of features. Um, I was thinking about when I was doing these sketches to help me with a sculpture uh, about posing, about how many legs this thing should have, uh, about you know general silhouette and and the story behind this this creature. And you'll see actually that the sculpture turns out to be pretty similar to what what those sketches are. So by going back and forth between sketching and sculpture, uh, you can actually really, really help yourself in a quick way. Again, this is another example, and you'll see the sculpture, which is kind of an amalgamation of, of practical sculpture and digital and painting. But the idea here was scrawling, you know, there's not detail. It's about figuring out a pose. It's about figuring out the, the intention behind the character in this case. Again, like if you look back at the sketches, you can see, uh, I don't know if there's a laser pointer here, but this guy here who's, you know, the most kind of, or, or, or this guy here, um, there's a couple of different poses around there, but that's pretty much exactly what it turned out to be. All right, so process. Um, you know, when we talk about process, it can, be, it can be really, it can be a boring thing, but it's a very important thing to, to understand. Uh, why is process important? Because you need to take control of the medium that you're working in, regardless of what it is. Whether it's practical sculpture or digital sculpture, uh, you need to take control of it. In this case, digital sculpture, taking control of a digital meaning, uh, medium, it's about learning to think critically about your work. Uh, it can be incredibly technically challenging to, to deal with digital programs. It's hard just being at a computer for long periods of time. Um, and, you know, one of the main technical difficulties or the main difficulties is that it's so easy to do. And when I say digital sculpting is easy to do, I don't mean it's like easy to get good at. It's just easy to do things all the time. Uh, and that can be very disastrous or it can be dangerous, especially when you're trying to get better at what you're doing. Uh, you can literally do anything at any point in the sculptural process. So uh, adopting a kind of a, um, a sculptural, a traditional sculptural mentality around your digital sculpting can be really important in, in that sense as well, because it will teach you to think critically. There are so many things to do all the time when you're working on a sculpture. Uh, I, I'm sure if, well, I imagine you're here because you enjoy sculpting or that because you're sculptors, you know that there's all these moving parts all the time. Uh, and if you're working, uh, you know, in a, an environment where you're lucky enough to have a good art director or have someone, you know, doing solid concepts to follow, then at least you've got a, a landmark, you know, something to, to go towards. But if you don't have that luxury, uh, what do you do? You know, the best thing that you can do is have a plan of attack. So making a game plan about how you're going to break down a sculpture and then, you know, move through it. What's it going to take to finish that thing? Speaking of finishing, the last point in this kind of process thing is uh, finishing is way better than floundering. What do I mean by that? Finishing, finishing something so that it's not perfect um, 
is is much better than iterating over the same thing over and over again and not getting anywhere you know you've essentially made a whole bunch of sculptures that are the one sculpture and you haven't released anything you haven't finished anything and moved on to the next idea so it's an incredibly important part of sculpting digitally and practically and anything that you're doing actually finishing these pieces doesn't need to be perfect you just need to finish and move on that was the most creative slide I could come up with <laughs> the creative process it's, it's such a simple thing you know um, this is this is basically the the process block it out build it up and knock it back you know build up the forms uh, knock them back build it up again knock them back build it up <laughs> exactly it's simple until it's not simple um, and it can be incredibly overwhelming you know when you're like building something up and knocking it back building it up knocking it back when do you know to when to stop you know when do you know what's good enough when do you need when do you need to add detail or add more shapes or, or whatever this is the um, you know if you have an art director someone to help you that's really awesome but a lot of us are on our own sculpting and we need to kind of figure out a plan around how to get away from this because this is the killer you know this is the thing that will stop you from finishing things there's a better way just slow down uh, you, you need to work smarter rather than faster so if you're if you're just starting out sculpting which I imagine there's some seasoned professionals here but I, I know there's some people just starting out or wanting to get into sculpting or digital sculpting if your big goal actually if you're a seasoned professional and your big goal is to just get faster um, you're doing yourself a huge disservice you know speed is not the aim of this game making great art is the aim of this game you have to do it quickly sometimes but that is not the thing that you should be striving for getting better at your craft speed comes with experience uh, and not the other way around but trying to get fast uh, you're just cheating yourself of the experience of actually getting better or experiencing experiencing sculpting so take the time to learn well uh, yeah of course when you're in a working uh, environment it's high paced and you know people are constantly barking down your neck and you have to be working fast or you have to get something done by by a certain deadline we need to work fast and efficiently uh, but if that's the determining factor of, of your work then really what's the point why, why are you doing it you know we, we want to be able to enjoy ourselves we want to be able to enjoy the work that we're doing like I've mentioned, adopting a, a traditional sculpting mentality can really help with this. It can help you slow down. Uh, if you want to be a better sculptor, you should really practice practical traditional sculpture as well. Working in a physical medium like clay uh, will help you become more considered about your work. Uh, it'll help you think practically about your design and it'll force you to slow down and and make you consider the forms as you're building them up rather than jumping into detail be patient this is not something maybe people tell you but just be patient with yourself you know there's always going to be a point in your sculptures where you it's, it's usually like midpoint or getting towards the end where you're like oh my god I hate this thing I'm just going to ditch it or if it's a practical sculpture I'm going to throw it in the bin the amount of sculptures I've literally destroyed when they're almost finished is uh, it makes me want to cry but you know be patient with yourselves like the I I don't want to start ranting about you know things like art station but really man they they, they make you feel like you need to be pumping out 100% of the best stuff all the time this is just absolutely not the case. Maybe this is for more, more juniors getting into things, but don't let that overwhelm you. Be patient with yourself, be nice to yourself. You'll get there. Uh, it's a long journey. So make a plan. Break things down into manageable chunks. Uh, this is what you're gonna need to be doing in a company anyway, but if you don't work in a company and you're trying to get better, breaking things down for yourself 
is going to be super important manageable chunks that's the key blocking in the forms and working the sculpture up meth uh, methodically that was a hard word to say for some reason building it methodically is is the key okay cool so if you've got a piece of concept art this is a piece of concept art for a, a project that i'm working on uh, then you're in a good place but still this isn't good enough just to be able to say okay cool I've got a piece of concept art, now I'm just going to build that thing. How do you build this thing in an efficient, quick way that is going to help you get better as well, get better in practice? We're going to break it down, we're going to make a plan. This is what I like to do with all concept art, with all the sculptures that I'm doing, to make sure that you have a solid plan and you know how much time things are going to take if you are going to run into any problems along the way, you know, breaking things down like this, it's a great way of showing you not only the overall silhouette, but, you know, if there's going to be problematic areas or things that might take a certain amount of time, would it take longer or, you know, what is actually going to get you the, f the furthest, the quickest? This is, this, the plan is going to help you with that. So work with major forms first and work your way up in detail. Don't go the other way around, for goodness sake. Like, I've, man, I've seen it so many times where people start spraying on detail before they've even blocked something out. This is where you should start. Make sure everything's accounted for, you know. In the plan, you need to know what the plan is before you start. Uh, so m just make sure everything's accounted for. This is a critical stage of like blocking in the silhouettes, as I say. Um, uh, the other benefit of this process is working things up all together. You know, you you get a sense of what the thing is at its base level, and then you can build it up. Uh, you know, in quality as you're going all together, um, so that you you know you run into the problems all at the same time. You know, you're not building something up. To huge amounts of detail in a certain area and then having to work back into something. Of course digital sculpting you can work in in, um, in symmetry which helps speed things up but uh, work things up together it's going to really help you. Um, strong shape language. This next slide is uh, is more about shapes but strong shape language what do I mean about shape language? I mean the shapes that you build in the foundational stage of your sculpture, in that block out stage, are the things that are going to tell the story about your sculpture. So take your time and build really strong language around them. They're the things that are going to tell the story about your sculpture, whether it's a character or not. You know, if you look at, um, you know, which later on we'll, we will do the silhouettes of some of the most kind of famous sculptures you can tell them straight away because they have such strong shape language uh, there's a whole bunch of Disney you know things as well you know when you're doing when you're doing 2d animation you know triangles and squares and circles all signify certain um, emotions or elements or characteristics in in a character uh, triangular things depending on how they're oriented might be either you know an upside down triangle might be some really strong upper torso it could signify that a circle might uh, signify someone kind of homely and and um, uh, friendly uh, a square might be someone brickish you know it's telling the story about that all the detail at that stage is is irrelevant you know you don't need to know any of that stuff so shapes not symbols this is a something my friend Matt Katz who some of you may know uh, drills into his painting students shapes not symbols what do I mean by that something like this so no this is this is not this is not shape language this is drawing symbols onto a uh, a larger kind of mass of, of something. Eyes, for example, are not just, you know, these ellipsoid type shapes. They're a, quite a complex, you know, arrangement of planes and shadows. And you should be dealing with those types of things. I'm not going to go deep into that type of stuff. 
I just want to point out that that is something to think about. Mouths as well, you know, they're not just kind of circles. They can be if they're super stylized, but they just don't work in sculpture necessarily. This is much more like something that you would be looking at, practical sculpture at least. This is a good idea of blocking something out as well, blocking something out and building it up. But you can see this is a guy, Cyril Roccolane, who's a, an amazing sculptor. He works in this clay called uh, Monster Clay. But you can see as I scroll through these slides that uh, the forms don't change. You know, this is the block out at its most basic. And as you're moving through, nothing's actually changed. It's the same thing. He blocks it in, he breaks it down. We'll go back to the creative process. He builds it up and he starts to refine things once the, once the process is kind of there. But actually, if we were to go from this to the, the first one, the, the sculpture hasn't changed. So this is the importance of blocking something out. Uh, don't get lost in the weeds and don't jump straight into high resolution. I've added these both in at the same time. But, you know, because digital sculpting, sculpting is such a quick process, it allows you to go from zero to 100 straight away. This is something so, um, it, it traps everyone, you know, jumping ahead of yourself. Uh, and this is where kind of adopting that traditional mentality around sculpting can really help you slow down and building things up. So build in the shapes that are important to make the sculpture and then add detail afterwards, not the other way around. So if I was to take that sculpture that we broke down and put into its little constituent parts and build out a block out, this is what it might look like. Uh, and if uh, this is just going to repeat, but if you look at this first one, nothing's really changed in terms of the silhouette to the very last one. There may be some things that have been added as um, you know the sculpture refinement has, has happened um, and things that I may have changed kind of on the fly because I'm the art director as well and I can do whatever I want. Um, but this is, you know, this is basically the process. The very first one is super simple. It's just the shapes. We want to get proportions going. We're going to add in the costume at very, very basic, in a very basic way. And then work up the constituent parts uh, together, you know. Detail has nothing to do with this. In fact, there's no detail pretty much in any of this sculpture. It may be in a texture pass, but uh, definitely not in this. What's the importance of silhouettes? Can anyone guess that Pokemon? It's a beholder. <laughs> the the important thing about this though is like building a silhouette, you know, this is the importance of building out shape language. Uh, and you know, the, the most iconic silhouette generator ever, Pokemon. Um, you know, this is, this is the reason for it, because you need to be able to visualize something from a distance. You need to be able to uh, understand what the character is without actually seeing any of the detail. This has nothing to do with detail and everything to do with shape. So make your sculptures stand out by creating strong shape language and building really strong silhouettes. Uh, they need to be recognizable from a distance, like I say. Uh, if you've got something that's, uh, what have I got here? If something's running towards you and you want to know what it is quickly, you know, you're definitely not going to be looking at the skin pores, I can guarantee you. Um, it's, a, it's, it's the same with games, you know, like you see these sculpture, these incredibly high res sculpture passes done for massive AAA games with all this lovely textural detail it's amazing it's all on art station and you want to you know give up because you can never be that good and then you play the game <laughs> as who's looking at the poor detail i'm not i'm not looking at it um you need to understand what the character is you know that detail stuff is 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 not really the name of the game for any ZBrush users, this is probably the most underutilized thing I could um, say to use. You know, people have 
chastised me for telling them that they should be using this, but it's so important to be able to understand what your silhouette is doing when you're sculpting something. So if you, if you use ZBrush, I would use this little tool. I would drag it out to make it a little bit bigger. So as you're working, you can see this. Uh, the, if you're working in Photoshop, you can do the same thing with the little navigator. You make it small and uh, in, the, in the corner of your screen or whatever, and you can see as you're you know, painting something out how the silhouette is being built out. This is exactly what this is for, and it's incredibly helpful. Uh, mesh density. Mesh density is, is super important. It plays a really um, significant role, so, as does topology. Um, so, I mean, topology is one of those weird things with sculpting, digital sculpting, uh, solely digital sculpting. You don't really have a similar thing with practical sculpting. Although, an analogy to practical sculpting might be if you're over, you know, working with oil based clay and you're adding too much solvent or something and it starts to break down the actual surface of the clay. Uh, it becomes really hard to work with. This is the same thing with topology. You want to break down the barrier of, of what is holding you back from just being creative and making cool stuff. So don't poo-poo um, topology is my note here. Um, topology is super important. Don't forget it. All of these different things are you know, good in some sense. When I talk about topology, um, sculpting-wise, I mean, you don't need to have the most amazingly laid out edge loops for actually sculpting something. It's going to help you in some ways, but having something, a mesh that is, you know, evenly spaced out so that as you subdivide uh, your, your layers or, or whatever, your subdivisions, um, everything's going to stay consistent. That's, that's the main key. And things aren't, you know, spread out all over the place. So you don't need to make this incredible model with all these crazy edge loops to just get started in, in, in sculpting. On the other hand, you don't want to start, you know, at a point where you've got a billion polygons and you're just trying to block something out. That's probably worse. I think I've got something as, as we come up. So, uh, you know, start low and, and, and build it up. That's really the main thing. It's super important. And let the forms guide you. This is um, something probably more to do with organic sculpting, but uh, with sculpting in general, let the forms kind of guide you as to what you're doing. You know, you can start out with a, an amorphous blob and at a very low resolution, start sculpting something in. And those base shapes, this is the importance of base shapes again, Base shapes will start to inform the next level of, of shape language. So you can see here, this is the block out. Those things don't really change. Uh, I've put in the very basic things to begin with, and then they've informed any, any other um, shapes after that. Uh, there's no detail in here, not really. There's maybe some secondary shapes, but there's no tertiary pores, nothing like that. And it still reads as being a, a fleshy, Th thing. What's a beholder? An abomination. Um, okay, so this is kind of what I mean about working uh, at a lower resolution. Hopefully this plays. Yep, there we go. Hopefully you can kind of see it. So building something up, this is at a lower resolution now. Building something up at a low resolution, sculpting something in, you know, sculpting some forms in, you can use, I'm using a clay build up brush here and a damn, a damn standard brush, building up some forms and scratching them in with some lines and then smoothing it down. When, you wor when you're working at a lower resolution like this and you smooth something down, as you can kind of see, you'll be able to get those really lovely uh, forms that look like they're kind of underneath the skin. Then you can build it up again and smooth it down again. This is that creative process, back and forth, back and forth. On the other hand, this is, uh, so, yeah, for ZBrush users, this is the Dynameshed version. And this is what really not to do. I mean, it's it's helpful in some ways, but definitely when you're not blocking, when you're blocking something out, this is not what 
this is what not to do. Having something at a very high resolution and sculpting these base forms in, it's never really going to work. You might get some cool detail out of it, uh, but this is not this is not the way forward for efficiency or or getting something to look good. You know, this is exactly the same process, just with a lot more polygons, hundreds of thousands, millions, maybe more polygons. So I'm doing the same thing. I'm trying to smooth it down, and it's not working and then I'm building it back up it doesn't look good you know this is the importance of working at a low resolution and building out forms cool so when it comes to posing something this is like the the final stage usually uh, this can be really difficult especially when you're working digitally because and if you don't have the lower resolutions of things, generally you have to pose something using a rig or ZBrush has some cool moving tools, but really it's a it's an, an arduous kind of long process. So, you know, to help yourself, act it out. You know, it can really, it can help you get the feeling of a sculpture. Uh, gathering references is another incredibly important thing gathering references doesn't just mean just getting shit loads of excuse me my language um, uh, getting a lot of pictures and um, putting them in a board and then not really knowing what to do with them uh, you know gathering reference is one of those things where you need to be critical about what you what you actually want to do with the thing what tells the story about um, uh, what you're actually doing a really good resource and I've, you can email me or, or whatever if you don't uh, note it down but Scott Eaton's Bodies in Motion is an incredibly good uh, resource for, for doing that he's got 3D models and photos and all types of cool things there you can learn about kind of body motion and, and, and shape language through that creating interesting shapes that's exactly how you're going to do it look at those resources look at people look at shapes sculpting doesn't just have to be you know creatures or characters you know you can look at buildings and be sculpting a building look at the shapes that you you know are around you this is going to be incredibly important uh when you're building something up make sure that you're turning it around as well I, how many times have people done this i know I've, I've done it i've seen a lot of people do it where they sculpt something from the front and then they turn it around and it's like a plane and like, oh, oh God, now I've got to actually sculpt the, the thing. Make sure as you're building something out, you know, to look at it from different, from different angles. When you're posing something, it's, it's, it's exactly the same. You need to be able to look at something from one angle, pose it, turn it around, see if it's working, you know, tweak this, tweak that, but constantly be moving around. And most importantly, tell a story with what you're doing. So... So this is a guy, Simon Lee, um, he's a practical sculptor who works mostly in films but a lot in games. He does this kind of sketchy style of, of sculpting but the reason I have it up here is in terms of um, creating dynamic poses you know, uh, and telling stories through the way that you're posing something. There's really not a lot of detail, there's, a, there's some detailed mark making in the image on your left but uh, actually most of the story comes from the posing. So when you're working dynamically, uh, sketching can be incredibly helpful for this, but working in clay, you can, you can do this type of thing as well. But creating a dynamic scene, creating uh, some kind of uh, dynamic pose is, is a good way of telling story. To get something really dynamic, uh, often you need to over-exaggerate something uh, and then pull it back. A lot of the time I see like these super, super, super exaggerated poses uh, and they haven't kind of pulled it back into reality a little bit. That's another kind of good point, you know, don't just, not, not everything needs to be a superhero um, or a Marvel movie. I heard a couple of sniggers there. That's a, yeah, that was a little jab. Um, this is a, a two guys actually, the Shiflet brothers. They do similar things um, in terms of fantasy sculpture, but their sculptures are much more subdued. So 
when you're posing something it doesn't always need to be like i say the super action based thing uh, they can be much more subdued when you're this so these guys obviously work practically and they can you know move their armatures or whatever uh, into place which can be really helpful for getting subtlety but when you're working digitally say so i've got this guy who uh, was an incredible pain to pose and takes a long time to pose because there's a whole lot of moving parts um, so when you're working digitally and you're trying to pose something uh, this can be a really long uh, process you know so how are you going to help yourself well, we'll go back to the start do some sketches it's so important to have I have a sketchbook with me all the time I've got my sketchbook here today uh, but all the time if you're trying to figure out a problem or get something uh, you know working when you know the process of actually doing the thing is going to take a long time get into sketching and and sketch the thing out um, and just these few sketches sketches really helped me actually pose this thing which took a long time and like I say posing to yourself is really helpful I, I don't know I do this all the time and to maybe think people think I'm weird or when I'm reviewing animation or something so hey he's like he has to deal with it all the time and he kind of like I was sitting at my desk and what what are you, like acting something out that when you act something out with your own body it's going to help you it's going to help you translate it into your sculpture or, or whatever you know your animation or, or or whatever it is so i remember sitting here like for this guy just this like this for ages trying to understand what he might be doing but this is this this is building story around uh, characters as well you know you have to tell a story through your sculpture if you spend all this time sculpting out something blocking it out and, and breaking it down and building it up and adding detail and all this kind of stuff and then you pose it in a uh, I don't know in, a, in an unimaginative way uh, or in a way that doesn't tell the story of the sculpture man that's a lot of time that's been wasted so really think about it and and you incorporate your body into how you're into how you're doing it so i mean with this character i wanted to create the scared kind of whimpering uh with a certain amount of intelligence but ultimate ultimately this kind of chastised slave something um you know uh so creating that kind of hunched um diminutive type pose was something that i really wanted to go for and it's subtle it's not a marvel action man pose so subtlety can be as impactful as as dyna dynamism sometimes i find it much cooler okay to end things the big picture how do you get better at sculpture you finish things finish things don't flounder around make sure that you're actually finishing things some of these things are going to be a little bit more sentimental maybe rather than sculpture based but do the best you can while you can. It's not a race. It's not, uh, don't feel anxious about people getting better than you or doing better stuff or doing more stuff. Sculpture's a journey for yourself, you know, and you should be getting better and feeling good about what you're doing. So you want to be doing the best you can while you can do it. This isn't anything to do with sculpture, but it's got a lot to do with the games and film industries working healthy and being healthy this is going to help you be a better sculptor it's going to help you be a better person working with it's going to be it's going to help your um, general mentality I may be preaching to the choir but working healthy and being healthy is super important stay fit get outside work practically instead of digitally sometimes um, and you know that can help in more ways than one make great things for a long time longevity rather than burning yourself out is the key so please be patient with yourself uh, as i say and be nice to yourself because you want to be in the game for a long time <sighs> thank you everyone for for sitting through that and uh if you want to get in touch with me uh please feel free to email me or or instagram me i tend not to be on heaps of platforms but uh i 
absolutely love getting emails from people and, and helping people. So please get in touch with me. And I think we've got quite a, a little bit more time. Uh, if anyone wants to ask any questions, if you've thought of anything as we were going, or maybe I've missed something. Uh, nice. All right. We've got a microphone. Oh, you don't want the awkwardness of a microphone in front of you? Hello, James. Hello. Um, I was just going to ask, what process do you actually use to pose the models? In, do you do it in ZBrush or do you rig them up? Or So, well, this is, this is the kind of diff... I'm glad you asked this, but I, it's a... It's, um, with a talk like this, I didn't want to get into details about anything in, in particular. But generally, when you're posing something in something like ZBrush, uh, you can use things like Z sphere rigs and you know Z poser, T poser, and all that kind of stuff. For that guy, because it had a marvelous designer costume on it, the process was a little bit different. Um, but I can harken back to the working at a low resolution, because generally what I would do is work something up so that the resolutions for um, each subdivision are there, uh, and I'll pose the low resolution and put that into um, a marvelous designer when it's posed uh, over top of the original T posed version. And if the vertice count and position is the same, then you can just swap it out and it will uh, animate into that pose as, as a morph target. So basically, what I did was sculpt everything in a T pose and then uh, drape it with costume swap out the posed um, base mesh in, that I did in ZBrush into Marvelous Designer and then create a blend, blend shape um, to pose the cloth on top of it and then export that out and then rejig stuff in, in ZBrush and then re-sculpt so all the stuff, you know. That. Very informative, thank you. <laughs> What considerations do you think should be made in terms of uh, designing and preparing sculpts for going into production in games? Uh, so, I mean, production of games, is, production of sculptures in games is, is one of those things that is always going to change at every level, you know? So, you might be halfway down a sculpture that you're really happy with and then an art director or a, a creative director or some manager might say, actually we want to change like 70 percent of that um and how are you going to mitigate the changes you know to, to be out of to be able to work effectively efficiently in that case really the way of doing it kind of is comes back to that block out and breaking down a sculpture and making these manageable chunks for yourself so that you know when something gets changed out uh you know how long it's going to take or what might need to change to actually effectively get that uh, that new you know change incorporated in what you're doing so i mean th i think the most important thing to 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 think about when you're working in production is to work systematically break things down appropriately work um, in consistent levels of detail uh, and make sure that you're saving uh, versions, you know. Yeah. Uh, you you want to be mitigating, you know, your own stress and and making those changes, whatever they might be, because they're inevitable. It's, uh, you know, it's one of those things. As, uh, you know, l stressless as possible for you so that you can focus on just making good stuff. No, yeah. I guess the other aspect of that as well was in terms of preparing them for, say, real-time production what considerations I mean that's a whole different yeah. talk <laughs> um, uh, modeling low-res meshes uh, for for game production is just a talk in itself I mean yeah so are, are your characters generally uh, involved in real-time games or they, it doesn't matter the color count or the detail uh, as much as I can I'd like to make stuff for games especially now it didn't used to be um 
because you know the idea was just to make something cool particularly when you're working in collectibles or, or something like that you know you don't necessarily need to worry too much about uh, topology or, or low res meshes or, or whatever now I generally try and make low res meshes for myself what I'll do is sculpt something um, and make sure that it's working at a low res you know version in, in a block out or whatever and then figure out you know what the topology is going to be doing pretty early on as, as a low res mesh and then continue sculpting and make any updates as as I go um, when you get to like re-topologizing an incredibly dense mesh it can be fraught with disaster so again it's kind of that systematic workflow that really helps you um, if you know that you're going to block out these really important shapes in your sculpture and you know that early on then there should be really no reason why you couldn't get onto building a low resolution mesh mesh pretty quickly uh, and then tweaking it to you know fit your high res um, as, as you start building it out and if you make any like incredibly big changes then obviously you're going to have to renegotiate your low low resolution stuff but uh, that's generally what I would do. Cheers, impressive work. Yeah. Unless anyone else. Um, what do you think are good balances um, of like traditional work versus like digital work? Like, do you lean more heavily into one thing or the other, personally? Uh, it, that's a, uh, like, <laughs> when I say it's a personal question I don't it's not I don't mind being asked that <laughs> but it's a personal preference is what I mean uh, for me my passion is practical sculpture I think there's something uh, that without getting too controversial that is intrinsically missing in digital media that physical media has you know there's a there's a the physical connection between the media and you as a person sculpting something uh, that I think is incredibly important. It kind of imparts a certain aura into the thing. Uh, that being said, you know, working with practical traditional workflows in the um, digital media, in a digital medium like ZBrush or any sculpture um, tool, it, it can impart some of those things. If you look at um, Simon Lee, who was this guy, um, he's kind of more recently got into digital sculpting, and he's not a very good digital sculptor. In fact, <laughs> he's, not a, he's not a very good digital sculptor, but he is one of the best traditional sculptors, you know, in the world. And it it just it translates so well, you know, he, because he understands these forms, it translates into his digital work. So do I lean more into one or the other, or should you lean more into one or the other? I think they definitely have both, you know, their pros and cons, and they inform each other. So I try and do as much practical sculpture as I can, although my digital sculpture stuff is mostly, you know, takes, takes up most of my time. Awesome. Thank you again, everyone. And please do get in touch uh, if you want to.